It's time once again for health and family. It is estimated that a third of our population suffer from high blood pressure, which we know can eventually lead to strokes if left untreated. So what can we do if we have high blood pressure? Joining us today is Dr. Stanley James from the Premier Health and Wellness Center, who is a well sought after doctor here on the island. We welcome you, Dr. James, to health and family. Thank you. It's a delight to be here. And if memory serves me correctly, this is your second time here uh, with us on Health and Family. We did lupus, I think, in the past. Yes, we did. Yes, yeah. we did. Okay, so we're going to start off basic. What exactly is a stroke? A stroke is when there's decreased perfusion or blood flow to a part of the brain. So when the brain, which needs oxygen, doesn't have blood, it doesn't have the oxygen. So those cells in the brain, which require the blood to, require the oxygen to live, actually begin to die. And the death of those cells is what we call a stroke. Okay. So what are the risk factors associated with a stroke? Okay, there are two different types of strokes. Mm -hmm. You have one where there's actually decreased blood flow to the area of the brain. And that's usually because of fatty deposits that block up the, the, the blood vessels that take the blood to the brain. And then the other type of blood uh, stroke is when there's actually a bleeding in the brain. And that's where you can have high blood pressure that causes a rupture of a blood vessel. Or some people are on bl uh, blood thinners, and those blood thinners result sometimes in people bleeding in the brain. So there are two different types of stroke. Both of them result in the decrease of oxygen perfusion to the brain tissue, and that results in the death of that brain tissue, and that Ooh. leads you to having a stroke. The blood thinners, um, just wanted to talk about that. So that can actually cause a stroke as well? Sure. If a person is on blood thinners and it becomes too thin, and the area of the brain where there's some friable blood vessels, they can actually rupture and bleed, and that can result in uh, a stroke, one. Number two, if a person is on a blood thinner and they fall and hit their head, then that can also lead to a stroke. Okay. So both, most of us know that 120 over 80 is ideal uh, for... Yeah, that's correct. That's ideal. Um, but you won't be really considered high blood pressure until it's over 140 over 90. All right. So but, talk to us about the numbers, what they mean. So let's start, let's start with the, the top number. The Okay, so the systolic, which is your top number, mm -hmm. uh, and the, the bottom number is your diastolic pressure. Both of these are very important because they both affect the, pro the likelihood of you having a stroke or possibly causing heart disease. And even uh, kidney dysfunction can come from untreated high blood pressure. Mm. So uh, both numbers are very important. We want to aim as much as possible to have below 130 over 80, ideal 120 over 80. Now these numbers have recently changed, so mm -hmm. it's important that you ask your doctor, based upon the new guidelines, what should my blood pressure be? Okay. So, I, and, and of course, everyone needs to be abreast of the blood pressure because this is what we call the silent killer. Mm -hmm. it, many people are walking around with poorly controlled blood pressure, and they may just, someone can say, I saw son so yesterday, he looked fine. I heard he's in the hospital, now he has a stroke, or mm -hmm. he may have died from a stroke. Well, interesting, while we're talking about strokes, strokes is not the leading cause, uh, uh, forgive me, uh, blood pressure. Blood pressure is not the leading cause of stroke. Okay. The eight out of 10 strokes are actually coming from blood occlusion. That's blockage of the blood vessels. That the arteries? Yeah. The blockage of the arteries. And that blockage comes from fatty deposits mm -hmm. that are located in the bloodstream, often because of poorly controlled lifestyles. So, Dr. James, um, I know diet is a big risk factor in, in uh, getting a stroke, and I've heard that salt, it can be a killer, a silent killer, for lack of a better word, and uh, if you could explain to us why salt is such a no-no in, in people's diets. Sure. So, salt is associated with increasing blood pressure, and we know that one of the leading causes of strokes is high blood pressure. So, when you heat a lot of salt it, and you're already hypertensive, it can kind of maintain elevated blood pressures. But 
Blood pressure is the second leading cause of strokes. The leading cause of strokes, eight out of 10 times, is really because of blockage in the blood vessels. Mm -hmm. And that blockage can be directly associated with diet, which was your question. So people who have diets which have high in sugar and who are um, eating foods that can increase cholesterol have a higher likelihood of actually having uh, ischemic strokes. And of course, an ischemic stroke is very similar to blockage in the heart. Mm -hmm. So it's a heart attack, it's like a brain attack. Mm. Blockage of blood vessels with decrease in oxygen perfusion to tissues causing death of those tissues, that is actually what a stroke is. And so it's essentially what happens is a heart attack, the same thing happens in the brain. So De the brain like just sort of has a heart attack, for lack of exactly. a better word. So the tissue in the brain that is responsible for controlling the functions of the body dies because it doesn't have oxygen to that tissue. Mm -hmm. Decreased oxygen to that tissue is because of decreased blood flow. Decreased blood flow to that tissue is largely because of an occlusion or blockage in the blood vessel because of cholesterol and fatty deposits. So what are the symptoms of a stroke? I mean, I, I've heard of the the drooping and so forth, if you could be just uh, sure. a little bit more explicit on that. So uh, depending upon which part of the brain, and you can imagine the brain has different uh, parts of it that's responsible for different functions of the body. And there are large vessels that lead to these parts of the brain. If it's in the frontal lobe, there's the anterior uh, blood vessels. In the, side, in the side of the brain, there's the, the laterals. In the back, there's this, this, the uh, circumflex. So different parts of the brain are affected with different, uh, supplied with different uh, blood vessels. And so depending upon where your stroke is, that would actually tell you which symptoms you're gonna have. The large predominance, likelihood, possibility of strokes are people who have like, facial droop. Right. And you see maybe they, they can't talk very well. Other people may actually have some called hemiparesis, which actually the whole left side or right side of the body is actually not able to function. Uh, then depending upon other parts of the stroke, people have speech disorders uh, affected, some people have vision affected. So it's all depending upon which aspect of the brain was actually affected. And so there's an acronym which I did a little research on called FAST. Okay. The facial droop, you mentioned that. The, the arm weakness, can you talk a little bit about the arm weakness to us? Sure, so you know again, this is what you call the opposite side of the brain. So if you had a stroke on the left side of the brain, typically the right side of the body would be affected. Mm -hmm. And there is this thing on the brain, we call it homunculus. It's really just a, it's sort of like a way of visualizing the area of the brain that's affected. And so right in the central part of the brain, that's where the arm is affected. So if you have a uh, occlusion in that part of the, body, of the brain, then that would affect the arm. And so if it's a larger blood vessel, which supplies a larger area of the brain, mm -hmm. it's the larger area of your body that will be affected. Speech, uh, that is also going to be affected, the slurredness. I'm yeah, assuming, yeah, slurred speech. So some people have what's called an expressive aphasia, where they can't get the words out. Right. Other people have a broker's aphasia. They can say the words, but they just don't make no sense. They can have words well formed, but they're jumbling, they're just not organized speech. So depending upon, again, which part of the brain, which mm -hmm. will determine which type of aphasia that you have. And uh, obviously this is going to be addressed with rehab, depending upon what area of the brain is affected. And the T, standing for time, uh, I'm thinking must be very crucial, because the yeah. sooner you get to somebody that has a stroke, Sure. So the treatment plan for strokes are associated with using thrombolytics. This is a, a, a medicine that actually can be a, a clot buster. Now, if you wait too long, mm -hmm. you can imagine that the area of the brain, mm -hmm. which is no longer getting oxygen, if you don't have that clot busted early, that area of the brain would die. So you need to identify as soon as the, it's possible when you begin to have these symptoms, get to the hospital so that you can make it within the window of opportunity to get this blood thinner that actually will bu uh, bust the clot and actually allow your area of your brain to be perfused. Now, interestingly enough, the doctors at the hospital, once they identify you having a stroke, they have to determine whether it's a ischemic stroke, blockage of blood flow moving forward, or hemorrhagic stroke, too much blood coming out mm. due to blood thinners or a blood pressure that causes a rupture of a blood vessel. Once they've done a CAT scan to determine what type of stroke it is, then we talk about a treatment plan. And then we decide whether or not you're gonna use a blood thinner, which increases the perfusion of blood to that particular area of the brain that was uh, blocked. Alrighty, well we're gonna take a break at this time and we did briefly interview Mr. Mark Selly, 
who is the president of the Stroke Association, and here is what he had to say on this subject matter. I had a stroke in November 25th, 1991, mm. and um, I woke up with, like somebody pulled my power cord out of the wall if I was a TV. Mm. I had no power, didn't know what was going on, I was confused. And in my effort to try and get out of bed, I fell out and I hit my head on my mm. side dresser and I must have jarred the clot that was in my brain. Mm. And I got up and went to the bathroom and then I realized something was, wasn't right and, and um, somebody was missing me and called the 911 to come and get me and luckily I was, went to the hospital and uh, I spent about a week in the hospital stabilizing and then they flew me out to Boston um, and I spent almost four months there. All right, so... And the, and the outcome wasn't good. Um, the predicted outcome wasn't good and there was nobody here to, to get any answers or, or sort out any of the, the questions that a normal person would be asking at that time. And so when I got to Boston, I formed... I took the format that they had in Boston for families and brought it back here to Bermuda and started the Stroke Support Group. Well, thank goodness for that. Out of, out of, out of something that was already working fine in Boston. Right. So I didn't have to do a whole lot of work. And I started with Hilary Soares, okay. who had also had a stroke. They, first of all, they tried to diagnose to find out what the cause of my stroke was. Um, because once they know what the cause is, then they can start to treat you. Right. Um, there, there are several different reasons for, for a stroke. Mm -hmm. Uh, prior to the time of my stroke, my health was, was fine. I had my regular checkups. There were no dominant issues. Um, I was skinny. Okay. <laughs> and I've only become overweight as a result of the stroke right. and my immobility. So that was an issue at the time. Right. Um, but, um, you mentioned you were skinny, so being overweight is a big factor to, to getting that a stroke? Is a, that, into, yes, okay. if, if there's not another other issue. All right. um, and they decided that um, I'd had, I had a high factor 5 in my blood mm -hmm. um, tests. What and factor 5 is to do with um, blood consistency, oh. um, and my blood was very viscous, meaning, is, meaning sticky. Oh, yeah. And so um, the clot was formed from, it could have been a number of reasons. It could have been from dehydration, mm. but also per, two or three days prior to that, I knocked my leg down at the marine station at PW's, and um, I'd slid on a, on, a, on a bit of oil, mm -hmm. and I ran into the back of my truck with my leg, and, and that apparently was where the clot was started, mm. and it went around my circulatory system and ended up in my brain. The clot of blood. The okay, clot, yeah. so that's what basically caused. It only the... needs to be the size of a pinhead. That's all. Ooh, that's scary. Because once it gets into all the capillaries and stuff that gets up in the brain, once the blockage occurs, then everything beyond that point is starved of nitrogen, um, oxygen, oxygen, and everything else, and right. that's what that's where you get your stroke. Okay. And it can be affected by the left side or right side. In your case, it was. It's a. I have a right side effect which mm -hmm. took out my left side so that the brain the left and the right of the brain is the opposite the left brain controls one side the right, right. brain controls the other side and mm -hmm. it crisscrosses so i had a right side infarct and it took out my left side so i was paralyzed on my left side mm -hmm. somehow a stroke just defines your body from midline it's it's un, it's uncanny but that's, the way, that's how it goes. No, you're being informative. Very few people have a stroke that takes out both sides at the same time. So it's just usually one side and then the other side, I would think, becomes more prominent or... Right. Yeah. And then you depend on the good side to counter the weakness on the other side. Okay. Um, and, and very seldom um, do strokes take out an upper or lower part of the body. It's usually midline and one side. So in your estimation, and you did preface by saying that you're not a doctor, and you told me that offline. That my mother says I'm medically dangerous. Oh, and wow. she calls me, my, my name is David Mark, and she calls me Mark Sally MD for my two initials. Okay. But um, I've learned a lot of, along the way, I've read a lot, yeah, but I'm not, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not your medical professional. Well, we invited you because you've had a stroke, and so you're, you're the president. So some of my information may be a little off, off um, the mark, but it's no pun, pun intended mark. Okay. But it's, it's as close to what I take when I do, when I come, become involved with a client, um, that general information is very clear to me how to proceed with the recovery. 
So do you consider yourself still with a stroke or you're just are we, you're rehabilitated? Until you asked me to come here today, I really hadn't thought about my stroke for months. Okay. And then you put me to, to the task of going through some paperwork. Um, I deal with clients by doing home visits all the time and I still don't think about my stroke. But when you asked me to come here and talk, it's probably the first time I've thought about my own stroke. In 20-some years. In, 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 no, not in 20-some years, probably in, in at least two, two years. I, I don't think about it on a regular basis. Okay. It's just something mind over matter, and if it don't mind, I don't matter. Okay. Keeping active reduces the risks for diabetes, heart disease, arthritis, and stroke. These conditions can limit your lifestyle, but they are preventable. Exercise and a healthy diet are good for all ages, so make them a part of your daily life. Walk more often. Take the stairs instead of the elevator. Leave the car at home sometimes. You'll be amazed how easy it is to be more active. Get on the move to a healthier you. This is a message from the Department of Health. Welcome back. If you're just joining us, Dr. Stanley James from the Premier Health and Wellness Center is here and is talking to us about the dangers of getting a stroke. So, uh, Dr. James, we were talking about uh, the, the acronym FAST for the facial droop, the arm weakness for A, and S for speech, the slurred speech, and the, the T, very important, the uh, importance of uh, getting the person to a hospital in time to hopefully to deter it being worse. Yeah, so you need to get the patient to the hospital as soon as possible. Why? The longer the brain is without oxygen to that, uh, to that particular part of the tissue, the brain, mm -hmm. uh, the more likelihood that that particular part of the brain will actually die and that, permanent, that stroke will be more permanent. So time is very important. If you have symptoms that seem like a stroke, slurred speech, arm weakness, uh, leg weakness, um, confusion, get to the hospital and get there as soon as possible because if they can determine that it's a stroke early, they can begin to give you the thrombolytic, this particular clot-busting medicine to increase the likelihood of you having recovery from the stroke that you're having. All right, so what can be done to reduce the risk of a stroke? Okay, so depending upon the type of stroke, number, right. number one, if you're talking about a hemorrhagic stroke, that is when it's too much blood bleeding in the brain, you need to maintain blood pressure. Number two, if the bleeding in the brain is from blood thinners, you need to make sure that your blood is not being thin too much. So you need to make sure you're checking your INR or your, your medicines that are responsible for managing blood thinning. Mm -hmm. But again, that's the second leading cause of stroke. The largest cause of stroke actually is the ischemic. That's a blockage of blood flow to the area of that brain. Mm -hmm. So you need to maintain that, um, those blood vessels open. And the way we do that is you need to maintain your cholesterol. You need to make sure you don't have uncontrolled diabetes. Mm -hmm. and you need to make sure you have an active lifestyle. Mm -hmm. These are three things that you can actually do. And, and fourthly, there's, third, fourthly, there is actually the issue of obesity. Patients who are obese increase the probability of having strokes. Uh, now, there's another form of stroke that's coming from something called atrial fibrillation. And that's an irregularity of the rate of the heart. And if, you're, if you have atrial fibrillation without being on blood thinner, you have a higher percentage chance of actually getting a stroke. So cholesterol, uh, managing your diabetes, uh, make sure you have an active lifestyle, dealing with obesity. Mm -hmm. These are factors that can be, if they're maintained and managed, you can decrease the probability of having a stroke. Okay. There's some victims that, that, that um, they may suffer from a stroke, but it's not known. Can you explain that to us? It's sort of an abnorm abnormality. Sure. You're talking about cryptogenic strokes. Yeah. So what is the exact cause? They can't really tell, but the patient does end up with the symptoms of having uh, a weakness or a motor function deficit. They, they're not able to move the body in a certain way. So this is cryptogenic strokes, and they're quite sure exactly what's causing it, but they do see the symptoms, and they can say it wasn't ischemic, it wasn't hemorrhagic, but the person does have the symptoms. Okay. So if I'm living with somebody and they have a stroke, what should I do immediately? Immediately you need to get them to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And time, is, as mentioned earlier, it's time sensitive. Um, I would 
if you, I wouldn't ask, I, you can call the doctor on the way to the hospital, but don't go to your doctor's office. Okay. Because that's okay. wasting time. Emergency. Go to the emergency room immediately there. We have a very well staffed emergency department, which is very well equipped with the uh, ability to diagnose this early and also early intervention. So do victims of a stroke ever, ever return back to their normal life if, if caught in time? Question. Very good question. Uh, it depends upon three things. Number one, the type of stroke that you have. Number two, the type of intervention that you have. Do I, you know, do I get uh, to the doctor early enough before that particular part of the tissue dies? Mm -hmm. And number three, the aggressiveness of the rehab that you have. Right. So rehabilitation is a very important part of the recovery of strokes. That was actually my next question. So the rehabilitation, what does that entail? What does that look like for a, for a stroke? It's a multidisciplinary team. Typically, okay. depending on what the stroke is, you actually can either do it here or people actually abroad where they actually have speech therapists if they need a speech therapist, mm -hmm. physical therapists, they need a physical therapist, occupational therapist, they need an occupational therapist, a neurologist or a physical medicine rehabilitation physician. All these folks work together to get you back engaged with moving those particular parts of the body and retraining the brain to have other parts of the body to take over the area that may have died. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that would be a multi multidisciplinary approach yeah, that's a multi dealing with all of those. Approach, yeah. So what are the chances of a person having a repeat stroke if, if they've had one already mm -hmm. and we, we've gone through the multiple dis disciplinary approach? Yeah. Are other chances great or small, or how does that well, work? You know, the most like the most the strongest predictor of a stroke is previous having a previous stroke. So, if you've had a stroke, you have an increased likelihood of having another stroke. So, managing the risk factors is very important. The medicines that your doctor gives you after having had a stroke are not optional. They're actually mandatory, uh, they're mandatory mm -hmm. because particularly the cholesterol lowering medications. If you want, if you have a hemorrhagic stroke, the blood pressure lowering medications, or if you want, if you have to have a blood thinner, that particular medication, uh, you need to take it so that you can decrease the likelihood of you having a subsequent stroke. So can I can I go the natural way, the alternative way, sort of um, yeah. doing people, the hibiscus drinking? I tell people, go ahead. Combine. If if you're so committed to natural. Start walking, that's natural. Yeah. Drink your water, that's natural. Okay. Uh, cut the carbs out and increase your, uh, d control your diabetes. Mm -hmm. That's natural. Okay. Combine that with the medications. Don't throw the medications away and then start taking uh, a potion that somebody put together saying that it worked for their auntie. Well, you know, it's good enough for your mama, it's good enough for me. That don't work in this, with this program. No, we, we do promote health here, I mean um, natural here, but yeah. I do understand what you're saying. No, and so I the combination, is important, go ahead. But I think that we have to make sure that natural, okay, if, if, you, if, you, if you have your leg cut off, mm -hmm. are you going to use natural to repair it? No. Okay. So you need to find what's the appropriate place for natural and the appropriate place for medical intervention. And I'm saying, particularly for stroke management, after having had a stroke, if you want to combine natural lifestyle intervention, do that, but use your medicines as well. Okay. So overall, what can I do to prevent a stroke? <laughs> I'm slowing over there. Okay, to prevent a stroke. Um, overall. Weight loss, weight loss, blood sugar management, mm -hmm. blood pressure control, cholesterol management, and e act, e maintaining an active lifestyle, eating fresh foods. Those things will help you significantly in reducing the likelihood of having a stroke. If you have atrial fibrillation, be on your blood thinner and your rate control medicine. Mm -hmm. And if you're on a blood thinner already, make sure your blood thinner is monitored and it's not too thin. Okay, and leave that salt alone. Well, you know, you can have some salt, but if you have high blood pressure, then if you're having salt and it causes the blood pressure to go up, you want to reduce the salt. Okay. Give us any final words on this topic, because it's a very important topic here locally, uh, obviously across yeah. the world, because... Um, like I said, a lot of people um, do get, there was one question, is uh, do men are more prone to get high blood pressure or strokes rather, or women, which is it? Or I'm not sure which, which have the greater preponderance. I, I couldn't tell you if it's okay. male or female, but I know that both of them have a, a high incident. Right. Uh, it's the most debilitating experience of a stroke because there's nothing that a doctor can do to reverse the damage when it's permanent. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure you reduce the likelihood of you getting a stroke because with strokes comes other things like pneumonia, 
with strokes can really? be quite sure. When you have a stroke, you may have a problem with swallowing. You can choke on your sputum. Okay. It leads to pneumonia. Um, and the, the complications of the stroke it makes the life very much, much more difficult. So reducing the likelihood of having a stroke, being aggressive about it, mm -hmm. is very important. Blood sugar control, I can't overestimate that. Diabetics have a higher incidence of having strokes. Kind of uh, hand in hand? Yeah, they go together. Cholesterol, very important. Make sure your cholesterol is well controlled and monitored. Mm -hmm. Blood pressure, make sure your blood checkers, pressure is evaluated. And obesity, a global impact that it can have on increased life, likelihood of having cardiovascular disease, it needs to be well controlled as well. All right, thank you so much, Dr. James for, for uh, giving us this, because we need to do this here on this island. Yeah. I know it's, a, it's an epidemic, for yeah. lack of a better word. Yeah. All right, we want to thank Dr. James for sharing his expertise with us. We also want to thank Mr. Mark Sally for his contributions to our program. At the end of the day, it really is up to us to make those changes that will ensure us a long and healthy life. I'm Shay Dawn Burgess, and this has been Health and Family. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.